fracking, what it is and why we should all embrace it. Hydraulic fracturing, fracking, is a widely discussed and frequently misunderstood uh, term in the news today. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> in this lecture, you will learn what fracking is, how it is done, the many benefits it offers, the facts and science to dispel the many popular myths about its use in the oil industry. This is a technology that is critical to our everyday lives and one that everyone should better understand. Howard Roerig is a small business owner in the Denver, Denver metro area and lives in the mountains of west, west of Sedalia. He has been involved in objectivism for 50 years and is one of the founding members of Front Range Objectivism. With the rise of the environmentalist movement and the many controversies over energy, he has developed a strong personal interest in the role energy plays in our lives. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. I'm going to stand here so that I can still see and work with everything. There's a certain amount of irony in talking about abundant energy after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll try. <laughs> uh, full disclosure here, I am a consumer of energy. <laughs> and it's likely that much of that energy has come from fracking. So I just uh, wanted to let you know that I might be a little biased in my presentation. There's been a lot in the press and on the web about fracking. Um, and one of the first things I wanted to point out is, you notice I misspelled it. Um, I overrode my spell checker. Fracking spelled that way is because um, the oil industry has used that term as a contraction of hydraulic fracturing. And you notice fracturing doesn't have a K in it. So the fracking is popular press, but anybody in the oil industry is going to spell it that way. So I, that's just a, a little aside. <coughs> so we hear a lot on the web, in the press, on television, uh, news stories, and an awful lot of it is negative. From celebrities like Yoko Ono and Lady Gaga and their artists against fracking, to folks who get angry when the EPA tells them their drinking water is safe, to goons like Gasland director Josh Fox, who intentionally disseminates false information to support his anti-frack position, We've all heard and seen many of these uh, negative comments. So, what is fracking? And why are folks so adamant in their arguments against it? What are these arguments, and why are they fighting against such a technological boom? When you have something that does this for your natural gas production, and all of that increase is just fracking, very little is new wells drilled without fracking. In fact, I would say none. When you've got a technology that will do that, what on earth could possibly be the problem? So, what is fracking? Fracking is the, in hydraulic fracturing, is the injection of fluids at high pressure into a well bore, and I'll talk about that, to create cracks or fractures in the rock that allows the fluids and gases to flow back into the well bore more readily. Well bore is a term that's used throughout the industry, and all that is, very simply, is the hole with the drill bit leaves going down. That's this, if I get this right, that's this guy here, or this guy here. That's the well bore. Let me give you a little bit of. Uh, petroleum geology here, very little. Traditionally, gas and oil wells were drilled into a gas reservoir. And it was just a straight vertical drop down and the surrounding pressure from the, the, uh, or the pressure from the surrounding rock and overburden would force the gas in the reservoir or the oil up, back up um, through the well. Oftentimes, in the early days, we had gushers because they didn't have any way of controlling that pressure and they would end up with literally millions of gallons a day coming back up the well bore before they could gain control over it. The gas reservoir, just as, as a point of clarification, you know, people hear the term reservoir and they think, oh, that's a pool of oil down there or, or a, a big room of natural gas. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. That gas reservoir or that oil reservoir is sandstone or some other highly permeable limestone, some 
rock formation that has the gas and oil in it. It is covered with a seal layer of hard rock, impervious rock, and that's what they're having to drill down. There may be multiple other layers in here, and then, of course, your, your soil and, and aquifer and everything up here. So this is just an, an area of sandstone, limestone, softer rock that has accumulated over millions of years this oil and gas. The oil and gas came from the source rock that's down below it. And the source rock, most of the time for what we'll be talking about today, will be shale. Uh, and hence the term shale oil or shale gas. Um, prior to the, to the discovery of how to frack a well, all we had were vertical wells. And that was true from the 1850s with Colonel Drake all the way through 1949 uh, when they started fracking. All we had were just vertical wells. And once you exhausted the pressure down here, then you could put a pump in at the surface and that pump would pump from down below. Any accumulated oil and gas that accumulated in the well bore, it would pump that up to the surface after all of that the pressure was, uh, was alleviated. And so we had things like um, oil wells that would run under their own pressure for six months or 12 months or five years, and then all of a sudden they would give out and they would install a well, uh, um, a pump, um, I'm sure all of you in driving through any oil country have seen the old walking beam uh, pumps running and those will, would run on a schedule. They might pump for a couple of hours and then they'll shut down to allow the surrounding gas and oil to seep back into the well bore and build up enough to where they can pump a few more barrels. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the sort of thing that's going on. Um, all of the gas and oil wells that were drilled all through that period, from the 1850s all the way up to 1949, every one of them was a vertical well. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about Spindletop in Texas, which was one of the really, the first big Texas discovery and the first really, really big uh, discovery in the U.S., to um, the Barnett Formation, which goes uh, throughout Central Texas, the uh, Austin Shale Formation, which um, is a, uh, a big sandstone shale formation that goes all the way across some of Mississippi, all of Louisiana, and all of Texas covers a huge, huge path all the way across. Um, all of those wells that were drilled were all into this type of a structure. Uh, it's not coincidental that this is shown as a dome. You've probably heard about salt domes um, that were drilled. Spindletop was a salt dome. Um, all of Saudi Arabia are all domes that they've drilled down into. And that's just a reference to the impervious salt or other seal material that has been forced up geologically over time and created that kind of, uh, of structure. So the shale down below being our source, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on here. Where did this come from? Uh, is this something that has just always been there? Well, it's been there for a few million years anyway. What this is, this whole uh, area here, is material biomass that was deposited millions of years ago, subsequently covered by usually several thousand feet. This is almost always six to 7,000 feet, sometimes 12, 14, 18,000 feet of overburden. And it's just sat there for all of these years under very high pressure and very high temperatures and a lot of time that biomass was converted to something that's called kerogen. <coughs> kerogen, K-E-R-O-G-E-N, uh, is basically a rock. It is a rock, a shale, um, almost always, that has some organic content. Now that organic content may just be something that hasn't formed into oil or gas yet, or it may, if it's been cooked long enough and, and sat for enough, enough uh, eons of time, that kerogen will eventually break down into oil. The oil is a little smaller molecule. 
uh, as you would expect from pressure and temperature, you, you get a little smaller molecule. So that's your oil. If it cooks long enough, that oil gets broken down and it becomes natural gas. If it cooks long enough after that, it's nothing but carbon. Everything's gone. <laughs> um, and so your, your uh, shale rock may have a mixture of kerogen, oil, natural gas, carbon, or it may just be shale, <laughs> depending on, on what you've got. Geologists have become very good at locating shale that actually has something in it. All right, so if we've exhausted all of this, how do we get to the stuff that's down here? If you drill this down into here, you're going to get very little output. All you're going to get is the exposure of this Maybe it's a 20 inch hole, uh, diameter hole going down here. So you're going to have 20 inches times maybe 100 feet or 200 feet. And the diameter of that and the 100 or 200 feet, you put a perforated pipe down there and you get a little bit of seepage from the surrounding shale, but it's not going to be very much and it certainly isn't going to justify the cost of drilling. So geologists needed to find a way uh, to exploit this gas and, and oil down here. And the way that they came up with doing it is to take that vertical well bore and magically get it to go this way and then create a bunch of fractures. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. <clears throat> so we start out with a vertical well bore up here, and we start down and we go past all of the uh, groundwater aquifers that are rarely any deeper than a thousand feet, usually uh, more like 800 feet, certainly no more than 1200 feet, and we go through all of the rock overburden, everything all the way down until we get down to an area where we know we've got oil bearing shale. <clears throat> that can be, this distance from here to here can easily be 12,000 feet. Think about that, over two miles down into the earth. At that point, they do something pretty, pretty miraculous. They manage to get that well bit, that uh, drilling bit to turn and go sideways. And they're still pushing down from here, and in, instead of going on down vertically, they end up going horizontally. How do they do that? Well, if we go back just a second here, oops, let me find my, we have come disconnected. It's left making arrow. a red light when you press the button. You can left the arrow though. Someone did hit that. I just want to go back a slide if we can. Is it completely wrong? Oh, the timer is still on. The timer is still blocked up. That's what he did. It's a good Nobody wished you good luck when you started. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Just see works. Well. There we go. Thank you. Hopefully you can go forward from this. Okay. Uh, when we were looking at, at um, this vertical well bore here, that was drilled up until very late in the, uh, in the vertical drilling process. Um, that was drilled with a bit that spun on the drill string. The drill string was nothing more than the pipe um, that they put down, and that whole pipe turned, and the, the bit was affixed to the bottom of it, and they did pump mud down through the center of the pipe to help cool the bit and also to flush the um, cuttings back up up to the surface. Otherwise, you just sit there and burn the bit and, and not get anywhere. So that worked pretty well. But there were a couple of disadvantages to that. First of all, you were wearing out a lot of bits because you were and and you were putting a lot of stress and strain on on that um, drill string because of the torque that you were supplying at the top. And by the time you got down. Uh, a mile and a half or two miles, you might turn that well, that 
drill string at the top six or seven full turns before it turned once down at the bottom because of the, of the uh, torque that you were applying to that. So they needed a better way to do it. And what they came up with is something that's called a mud motor. And this was a self-contained device that sits at the bottom of the drill string. It threads onto the drill pipe just like a bit would. Only instead of being just a bit, it was actually a motor that was run. The energy for the motor comes from the mud that they were forcing down the middle of the drill pipe. That's what would turn the mud motor and also control direction by firing jets one way or the other. That would allow the mud motor to be lubricated, to be cooled, and still flush all of the cuttings up to the top. That drilling mud, which is nothing more than a mixture of water and bentonite clay, that drilling mud performs one other really critical function. I mentioned gushers earlier. We almost never hear of a gusher anymore unless there's actually an equipment failure. And the reason for that is when you've got some 12,000 feet of mud on top of your drill string or in your drill string, that's doing a whole lot to counteract the pressure from the surrounding structure and containing any of the oil and gas that might be trying to come back up. So that along with the, the surface control of the valves and the, and the uh, blowout preventers and so forth that they put at the surface of the well, that's what allows them to help control that. Mm -hmm. We're locked again. All right. Okay. Go forward. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So the well, the well bore goes down through all of this rock structure. One of the critical things that happens very early on is down through the aquifer area, in order to prevent any contamination to the, the uh, water table, any of the aquifers, they do something a little bit unusual. Next slide. They install a little bit of shielding, 10 inches in fact, and more. And that shielding, one more slide, you can see we've got concrete, then we've got steel, We've got concrete, we've got steel, concrete, steel, concrete, steel, concrete, steel, concrete, and steel again, and then concrete on the outside that goes on down for the rest of the bore. This takes us down somewhere around 1,500 feet down to this level. Look at the incredible structure that they put in place in order to protect the surrounding environment. Now, they don't do that because the EPA says they have to. They don't do it because the government says they have to. They certainly don't do it because Josh Fox says they have to. They do it because it's in their best interests. It's the best way for them to remain profitable and to stay out of the courts because of property rights concerns. They don't want to be liable for contaminating groundwater. They don't want to be liable to the rancher that's down the, the uh, road and is complaining about his cows dropping dead. They want to be able to protect that. And that's also the best way to contain their oil and gas so that they get that much more to sell. So it makes a lot of sense. All right, let's go back to the back two slides, if you would, please. All right, so that takes us down through well past the aquifer. Beyond that, we have steel casing. And the really cool thing is they go down several thousand feet and they stop. They put a plug in and then they they run down and they drill part of that plug out and they force concrete down the well bore. And that concrete flows out of the bottom of the well, well bore and up the annulus, which is nothing more than the space between the steel casing and the ground. They force that concrete all the way back up. That's how they get a concrete encased casing around what we saw in that later slide. That's how they get that in place. Then they'll go back down with a drill bit, they'll drill through the, the concrete, and they'll continue on down. At some point, when they get down close to where they want to, to turn horizontally, they tell the mud motor to start turning. Now, this is all rigid pipe. This is, you know, pipe that's this big to this big, and it comes in 33-foot sections. It's all screwed together up at the top, one section at a time. And they start turning that. Well, you can imagine 
trying to turn something like that is not going to, I mean, you're not going to make a right angle turn like you do out on the street corner, right? <laughs> it's going to take a little bit. And in fact, they can turn two to three degrees every 100 to 150 feet. It takes roughly a quarter of a mile to make a 90 degree turn. Wow. But they can do it. And the really cool thing is not only can they do it, they can continue out here for 12,000 feet is very common. Sometimes they can go 14, 15,000 feet. Really the only limiting factor is how good their, their uh, seismology is and determining where they are and, and how accurately they can hold it. At some point, it gets to be a real, I mean, think about trying to push a piece of, of cotton string. At some point, that's what this starts looking like is a piece of cotton string. That's a lot to have to push. But that's what they're doing is they're just continuously drilling out here. When they finally get to the, to the point where they want to stop, they put a plug in, they finish casing with concrete, back up through the annulus, and they're ready. At this point, the well is, is finished in terms of drilling. They won't do any more drilling on this well for this horizontal bore. Later on, they may come back and drill right alongside and go the other way or go out this way, whatever they want to do. But for this particular one, that's the end of the drilling. The next thing that they do is they drop a special tool that is anywhere from, um, well, it's actually about 20 feet long. A special tool that goes on the end of the well string. They drop that down through here and they bring it all the way out to the end. And they've got electrical control of that. And they set a plug, temporary plug. And this 20 foot long tool is filled with explosive charges that fire darts up and down. So we get a dart that goes up here and a dart that comes down here. And all that dart is doing is piercing the steel and the concrete to give them holes. So that's all it's designed to do is it's just a real quick thump. And then they may even be that same tool without having to pull all the way back out. They'll pull it back and they'll do the next one. And then they'll do the next one. And then they'll do the next one. They'll, they'll, and they know where all of those are. So they'll do that all the way along that horizontal structure, that 12,000 some feet. After that, they come back down and they will set a plug at the bin, at the very end. And by the way, this is called the toe, surprisingly. This is called the heel, surprisingly. <laughs> and so they start out at the toe, and they will come back usually around a thousand feet, and they'll set a special one-way valve. And they force fracturing fluid down here at two to three thousand psi. Wow. And we'll talk about what that fracturing fluid is in a little bit. But they force that fluid down there, and it goes through the one-way valve and goes out into this area that's been that has been pierced, the casings have been pierced, and it forces the fluid up into the rock and creates all of the fractures. Now I said that the darts fired up and down. There's a reason for that. Think about how the rock is going to fracture. It's going to fracture along the weakest axis, right? And the weakest axis is going to be up and a little bit down, mainly up. You wouldn't get that much fracturing sideways, and so they wouldn't try to fire sideways so much as because of the pressure. You know, the pressure goes is less as you go up, right? So that's the direction that it's, that it's trying to go. So for the most part, you get, you get some fracturing down, but you really get a lot more fracturing going up. Those fractures can be, if I get back to my discussion here, um, somewhere between two and three millimeters wide. They may be 50 to 100 feet tall off of the well bore, and anywhere from 300 to 1,000 feet long. So this, this section here that they just fractured, for instance, that may be 1,000 feet, it may only be 300 feet. And the geologists determine that. It's, it, you know, maybe the hardness of the rock, it may be uh, how much, how much uh, pressure they can apply to that rock at that point. A lot of factors that go into that. So they'll do that all the way along the structure. Once they've fractured the, the first area, they'll come back in, they'll set a plug at, at where that valve was, and they'll move the valve back a thousand feet, and they'll fracture again. 
and then they'll they'll just repeat that until they get all of, all of the horizontal area fractured. They pull everything out, pump all of the all of the um, um, uh, fracturing fluid out, and they force a slurry of water and sand, specifically sized sand, or it may even be ceramic beads, that they force back down through here and out into all of these fractures, and that's what's called a propant, P-R-O-P-P-A-N-T. And the, the function of that propant is really critical. That is what holds the fractures open so that the gas and oil can seep in and uh, go ahead and, uh, and have it be a productive well. That propant um, stays in place, um, and it once it's in, they have a producing well because as soon as that propant goes in, they start to get oil and gas and water back out um, and up the up the well bore. That well will continue to produce oil and gas for anywhere from a couple of years to as many as 90 years as a result of that, again, depending on the geology of the area and so forth. But these, these wells are designed to, to produce for tens of years and can be for significantly longer than that. So that's what fracturing is all about, is just creating these fractures, these vertical fractures, and allowing the gas and oil that's trapped in this rock to flow down through. Now, you might think, <coughs> gee, Okay, you might get a couple of drops of oil and gas. Well, I can tell you something that, that is even more amazing. The oil and gas that is, is migrating into these fractures is about the size of a virus. Paul, you know what the size of a virus is, right? It is very, very tiny. So we are talking about something, something larger than a molecule, but it sure as heck isn't a tap water flow. And that's why it takes so much fracture uh, in an area to be able to get any production at all. And it gives you an indication of why when you just drill a vertical uh, well bore down through this area and you've only got maybe 100 or 200 feet of exposure to the rock, you're not getting much gas or oil. But when you go out here and you've got 12,000 feet of exposure and you've got all of these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet of fractures going out into the, onto the end of the shale, you start getting quite a bit of production off of this field. That's what allows you to get oil and gas out of this that you normally couldn't even tap. Does it pull much from horizontally from the sides of it? <coughs> very low. Up and down. So very you can low. Run it's it's virtually down. all, yeah, it's virtually all up and down. The fractures certainly go, I mean, it's not like they, they get a two-dimensional fracture. They do get some fracturing to the sides, depending on the rock structure and so forth, but almost all of it is, is really up and down. So you can get a bunch more just growing like two feet away or three feet away. Yeah, and that, and in fact, that's what happens. Sometimes this, this is so thick that they'll actually do more than one horizontal run. Mm. And they can do it off the same well. It's it's pretty amazing. They just they drop a special bit down here, and let's say they want to come out at this area, they actually drill a hole in the side of the casing with this special bit, and then they feed feed that mud motor back down, and they sense where that um, uh, hole is, and they very slowly start turning, and they come out, and they do it again. Hmm. They can also turn and go a different direction. If they're in a really wide field, they may go in two or three directions off of that same well bore. Oftentimes, it's more economical to have uh, m this well bore producing and run another well bore down right alongside it. And it may, they'll use the same pad up on top, and they may, have, they may drill three, four, five wells off that same pad, and they may be two or three feet apart, mm -hmm. I mean, literally that close. Yes. I just wanted to comment that um, there's also there's actually a lot of interest in getting a lot more information out of out of what you know which I forget what you call it but which like each little section of the, the each fractures, of the frac sections they don't they have very little information actually about where a lot of the oil and gas is coming from right they don't know which 
which one of those fractures is actually producing more than others. And so there's actually a lot of room for making this much more efficient process yeah. by finding out. One of the where. one of the really cool things, she's right. Um, just to give you an idea, roughly in the in the Bakken region, which is a new big huge field up in, in North Dakota, okay, in the Bakken region, typically they are recovering four percent of the available oil and they're recovering 20% of the gas. Gas obviously is a little more mobile than oil. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of room for uh, improvement and they're constantly making improvements. Um, one of the really cool pieces of this technology is how they determine where the heck they are. Mm -hmm. You can't run, I mean you can't run a, a scope down there. You can't even run electrical lines down there for some kind of electrical sensing. Um, that's almost never done because in a rigid, uh, a rigid well bore uh, drill pipe like that, you just can't do that. What they do instead is something that just sounds so bizarre you wouldn't think it would be possible. They read the seismic reflections off of this column of mud. The vibrations that come back up from the mud, they are reading those and analyzing them They've got these marvelous, unbelievably complex computer programs that allow them to build up a picture, an underground picture, of what all of this structure looks like, what all of this structure looks like, and, and just what the, the content of that surrounding trail is. And they're doing it all from seismology. That's also how they're controlling the direction and when to turn. I mean, they're, they're actually analyzing what's coming out. Obviously, they're also looking at, at the chips that are coming back up and, and saying, oh, you know, hey, gee, we're into the shale, guys, um, you know, as opposed to the granite they've been drilling for the last several hours. So there's a, just a lot of different things that they're doing, but there's a lot more room for um, improvement in order to get more than that 4% of oil. Hmm. How have, can they do angles off the horizontal shafts yet? Um, they can do flat angles. They can. They, well, actually, they've got they've got a little bit of control everywhere. Um, interestingly, at 12,000 feet, they can hold this position to plus or minus 20 feet. That's pretty good for two miles out mm -hmm. and two miles down. That's yeah. pretty amazing. Okay, a little bit about what's going on up on top here. There are service companies that provide pumps, tanks, fluids chemical, water, personnel. Typically, um, when a well is being drilled, there are 32 uh, people on the rig. There will be a total of 64 combined service companies, usually six companies providing those, six overview companies that are providing those 64 companies. Uh, and then admin. There's over 100 workers on the site, on this little pad, when they're actually doing the, the drilling and fracking. Uh, once the, the well goes into completion, then there's there's no problem. On initial flowback, once they, they do the fracking, initial flowback, uh, a really good initial flowback, according to Dave Biederbeck, who, who works in the oil industry, is 60% water and 40% um, oil, uh, oil and gas mixed. And that's considered really, really good. Sometimes they only get water back for a time, and then eventually the oil and gas start seeping in, and they finally get something out of it. Um, fracking was, was first used in an older section of the Barnett Formation, which is uh, the formation that underlies Fort Worth, Dallas, that central area of Texas. Um, the Barnett uh, field had dropped to, um, well, just to give you an idea, when Barnett was first drilled, find my place here, It's been in production since 1890, and by 2004, they were getting one to two barrels a day out of several thousand wells throughout the area. One to two barrels a day hmm. was all that the, the uh, field was producing. Then they started fracking. They went from one to two barrels a day, a day to 
three and a half million gallons or barrels a day coming out of the Barnett Formation. That's better than Ellis Wyatt. That's not bad. That's better than Ellis Wyatt. That is not bad. <laughs> One well can go from a barrel a day to 400 barrels a day after being fracked. Is it any wonder that 95% of the oil wells in the United States have now been fracked? And not one single well for oil or gas is drilled in the United States that is not fracked. It simply will not happen. The economics are not there. It doesn't matter if they think they are in the world's best salt dome. If they think they found the next Saudi Arabia, they simply will not do it because they can't get the economies of scale, the efficiency that they can get by fracking. And they won't do it. So they go someplace else, which is why there's no drilling going on in New York right now, because they won't allow any fracking. One other quick thing that I wanted to mention that, that uh, Dave Biederbeck does a really good job of talking about uh, in his information is the extreme safety culture that is that has become part and parcel of the oil industry. And I don't care if you're talking about on land or on a platform out in the middle of, of the Gulf of Mexico. They have highly complex, thoroughly documented procedures that they use for everything. A guy can't go get a cup of coffee without a 10-page manual to tell him how to do it safely. It is just really incredible to see the, the level of uh, confidence that they exhibit in keeping a job site safe. Any worker, from the secretary typing notes to the guy that's, that's supervising the, the drilling rig, any single member of that team can shut down the entire site simply by saying, there's something unsafe over there, and everything stops at a cost of a million dollars a day. Mm. And that has happened. There have been instances, uh, one that comes to mind very quickly was um, on an oil drill, uh, an oil um, platform, drilling platform. One of the cardinal rules is when a helicopter is inbound or outbound, the crane operator has to come down out of his cab. So there's no possibility of interference between the crane and, and the incoming copter. One day that didn't happen on a, on a rig that uh, Biederman was working on. They shut down the entire rig for three days doing an analysis of what had happened, what had gone wrong, why didn't this, this safety rule um, kick in, and they didn't start up again until everybody was satisfied that they knew what had happened and that it wasn't going to happen again. That's not, again, that's not driven by some government uh, initiative. That's not driven by anything more than the oil and gas companies looking at this saying, we don't want the liability. We don't want the lawsuits. We know that there's going to be accidents that are going to happen. Look at Deep Horizon and, and there's a lot of, a lot of guilt to be placed there. You look at, at anything that you hear about groundwater contamination on the surface where they'll have a, a, a holding dam break and they'll lose several thousand gallons. That happened up in Willow County a few weeks ago. Those things are going to happen. It's just like the, the crane that fell in New York City. You don't go in and prohibit cranes. You go in and figure out what went wrong and why, and you fix it. And that's what the oil companies have done for many, many years now. And that's really all I want to say about that. A uh, couple more quick terms for you. We talked about the well being drilled out and done. And at that point, the, well's, the well is done. But they don't call it complete. It's not completed until they actually go in and do the fracking. And it's ready to, to actually produce. So completion means something very specific to the, to the oil industry. It is a technical term. Recompletion is the same process of going in and, and drilling a horizontal and then doing the fracking and having that well become uh, more productive as a result of doing that. That's called recompletion. So those are the two terms that you might uh, hear very frequently. And one last thing that I wanted to mention, because it will come up in the, in the midst that I want to cover here real quickly, and that is um, um, something that I just forgot. I'll come back to it. <laughs> okay. So, what goes wrong with fracking? Why are people so concerned? I want to talk about the various myths that we hear. First one, this is a new technique. We don't know what we're doing. 
No, the first well was fracked in 1938, and it was commercially started in 1949 in the Barnett region. Over one million fracture treatments have been done in the United States. Thank you. So what changed that leads to our hearing so much about it? Two things. First is the ability to do hydraulic fracturing over a long period uh, at high pressures, and um, also the horizontal drilling which we did not have that, that technology a few years ago. That's really come into its own since the late 50s, early 60s. Um, also, early on, they did two to four fractures per well. Now they do 30 to 40 fractures per well. Also, by the way, they used to take them all week to do three or four fractures. Today, they can do 10 fractures a day. So they, they've got this down to science. <laughs> Um, so as a consequence of this increased production, we're hearing a lot more from the Bakken, the Eagle Ford, the Marcellus back east, the Barnett. All of these were barely cost effective or not even being drilled 10 years ago. Today they're all in production. And so as, as a consequence we hear a lot more about what's going on. <clears throat> Earthquakes. Your fracking is causing earthquakes. I can feel it. <laughs> well, you know what? This is one I have to agree with. Yeah, fracking does cause earthquakes every single time. Guarantee you. They can rarely be measured, and they have been for two decades. Microseismic monitoring is done all the time on every single well, 100% of the time. A typical quake, though, is equivalent to a truck driving by. Mm -hmm. We are talking about, on the Richter scale, minus two to minus three. Now, humans can detect three on the Richter scale. That is an order of magnitude five to six times. That's a million times less than what people can detect. These are very clearly understood mechanics. The volumes of fluid that are used are minuscule compared to what it would take to actually lubricate a fault and, and create a major earthquake. It's theoretically possible, but never once has there been a documented case of fracking causing a human-felt earthquake. Geothermal plants, on the other hand, are much more like, likely to cause seismicity, and in fact, they have hundreds of felt earthquakes around geothermal plants every single year happens all the time. Next one, contaminates groundwater. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Next one. And one more. Whoops. What happened? Oh, back up one, I'm sorry. There we go. As we noted earlier, just a few steps are taken to avoid groundwater contamination. There's thousands of feet of rock below here, as we saw on that other slide, sometimes as much as 12,000 feet of rock between water-bearing aquifers and oil-bearing shale, somewhere between six and 12,000 feet. It can be a serious problem, especially if they're fracturing shallow, and they usually don't because of that very reason, and if there's some kind of a failure at the surface, um, a dam breaking, a, an equipment failure up here on the wellhead that allows uh, fracturing fluid to leak, but those things are nothing more than industry accidents that are going to happen in any industry. And they are working all the time to try to safeguard against those. If zonal isolation is done properly, properly, there simply is not a risk to any groundwater. Testing and methods for controlling uh, fracking fluid and all of the other fluids are required. There has never in 1,200,000 wells fractured been a single instance of groundwater being contaminated. Surface contamination is a result of an accident? Yes. Groundwater contaminated? Absolutely not. Never happened. Okay, fluids used are hazardous fluids. Oh my gosh. 99% of the fracking fluids used are water and sand. 1% comprises polymers that, are readily, that readily degrade over time. There's no benzene used in spite of the media reports. Bactericides are safe, 
The industry has embraced full disclosure of fluids used, and yes, the government has required that, but industry has complied. There's primarily four water-soluble chemi chemicals used in that 1%. Water, a non-toxic polymer, usually a polyacrylamide, and a cross-linking agent, uh, basically a metal ion that cross-links with the polymer, and then some kind of a breaker that breaks up the gel that this, this conglomerate ends up becoming. <clears throat> Fracking will make domestic water flammable. Any of you, any of you seen gas land? <laughs> oh my God! Um, you know, he, Josh shows a, a guy lighting his his tap water and having it flame. Well, you know what? That's been going on for over several thousand years now, documented. There is naturally occurring methane in our groundwater has been, always will be, it's not coming from fracking. Absolutely not. And there's never been any evidence to that effect. The wastewater is toxic, uh, and injection of excessive amount of water consumed. First of all, only 20 to 30 percent of the frack water comes back up the well. Remember I talked about sometimes 60 percent of its water and 40 percent of oil and, water, oil and gas on the, on the initial. So we're only getting 20 to 30 percent of that water back. The best solution is to re they treat it to remove any chemicals, and then they re-inject it back into an, an old well or a new well that they drilled just to get the water back in. The salts, sodium, calcium, and so forth, some of the naturally radioactive material that are there are left because they're natural. Some water is now being treated and recycled for additional fracking. It is a modest amount of water used compared to traditional well drilling. Um, the amount of water you use is three to five million gallons per well. Now that sounds like a lot. That's a thousand wells. My God, I've used a billion gallons. Well, guess what? In one area of the Barnett in Texas, they use 3.1 billion gallons of, of uh, water. That amount of water turned out to be less than 1% of the municipal usage for that same area. Hmm. Or if you want to think of it this way, the amount of water used in the Marcellus Shale Formation back east was less than what was used to water the golf courses in the state of New York. One well uses as much water as it takes to water one Florida golf course. And Florida golf courses don't take that much water. The salt water used in natural gas wells will contaminate the surface. Again, this is usually heard in conjunction with the Marcellus Formation where they're starting to use salt water rather than domestic water. One more case of the environmentalists never being satisfied. They decide to use salt water and they modify their equipment and their procedures in order to be able to use it and then they complain about that. Causes large outbreaks of cancer, huge air pollution problem. Both of these come from Josh Fox. Again, absolutely no uh, evidence to that, and EPA does constant and very frequent monitoring, never any indication of that. The benefits to fracking, Financial Times reports that U.S. oil in imports will drop to their lowest level in more than 25 years in 2014. Mm -hmm. Less than 6 million barrels a day that we're going to have to import. This is half of the 12 million barrels a day imported in 2004 through 2007. The International Energy Agency now believes that the U.S. will become the world's largest oil producer by the end of this decade, perhaps even reducing our imports to zero. A recent article in MIT Technology Review describes a developing renaissance for U.S. manufacturing because of the abundant, inexpensive natural gas. Companies like Dow Chemical, spending $4 billion on the expansion of, of uh, chemical plants just in the next five years. The steel industry is booming because of all of the steel that they're having to supply to the, to the uh, uh, oil industry. Many industries are deciding not to move to, the, uh, to overseas. A University of Texas study notes that oil and gas development in a 20-county region overlying the Eagle Ford has produced, provided $25 billion in economic activity. The same is, can be said for every other area. All you have to do is look at the statistics for North Dakota where they actually have a surplus of jobs. There's virtually no unemployment and a booming economy. 
If we don't frack, there will be no more wells drilled in the U.S. It just simply is not economically feasible. So think about this. How do we eliminate 60% of our energy usage? Because that's what comes from fracking today. How do we eliminate that? How do, how do any one of you, can you tell me how you're going to eliminate 60% of your energy usage? Drive 60% less, use 60% less electricity, heat your house with 60% less energy? It ain't going to be a windmill, folks. Fracking is a tool. If it's used properly, it works really well and it's a benefit to all mankind. Think about trying to build a house without hammer, saw, or more appropriately electricity. You just simply can't do it. Fracking is what has allowed us to become much closer to energy independent, has given us a tremendous boom in cheap, abundant energy. And it's pretty terrifying to think that people are willing to cut humanity's lifeblood like that. We don't have, in this technology, a motor that will take static electricity and give us power. But boy, we've got something damn close to it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, go ahead and go one more. Or two. Whatever it is. There is a map of all of the uh, fields that are currently or very close to going into production with fracked wells. And, you know, right now, New York has said no drilling and no fracking in New York and several of these other eastern states say the same thing. Look at the size of that field that they want to shut down. Just huge. We have got more oil and gas than known reserves in Saudi Arabia. That's where we stand today. Can you go sideways from the state next door? Twelve thousand feet. Questions? Tom? Um, are the Saudi Arabia, the oil companies in Saudi Arabia using fracking? No, um, they're not, and in fact, it's not being done basically almost no place else in the world, and the reason is that it takes a tremendous amount of infrastructure to be able to frack and be able to do it economically. The United States has that infrastructure in place. One more benefit of being in a highly technological society. It costs more than double to frack a well in Europe today than it does in the United States. It simply is not economically feasible at this time. I and mean, you're, you're stuck with the old chicken and the egg. Oil companies don't want to invest in that given the political instability. I mean, a lot of Europe is saying, we don't want any fracking. A lot of Europe is running out of gas and oil, but I don't really care. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of that, I heard that the Russians are actually funding some of the anti-fracking stuff yeah. because that's their main revenue or big revenue, selling gas to Europe. That is, um, that is one of the things that uh, the director of Frack Nation points out um, that I hadn't even thought about. But Gazprom is, is the large, one of the largest companies in the world, uh, certainly the largest Russian company, and they provide most of the gas for Europe. Twice in the last 10 years, they have cut off gas supplies to Europe. You would think that would be enough to scare the hell out of the Europeans and keep them from sh shutting down fracking. But nonetheless, uh, there's a great deal of evidence to be had that Putin and his cronies are funding the environmentalists in this country. They don't want to see fracking succeed because they know that's going to cut into their marketplace. Good question. Steve? You, you, you talked about the infrastructure. I have a lot of questions. Um, so, um, start with the infrastructure. I understand that, that it costs about $60 a barrel to be, uh, for it to be economically feasible to do fracking. Is that consistent with what you've seen? Um, that's a pretty nebulous number. That's a good number for some areas. For other areas, that would be four times what it takes. And for some areas, it might take a little more. It really depends on the structure, the depth, the difficulty of the geology, um, and to, I, I to a great extent, the regulations. More, I think this one might have been more focused on the Bakken. That, that could very, actually, some areas of the Bakken are turning up natural gas at about, uh, at about half of that in, in uh, oil equivalent. Okay. I don't see Eagle Ford on your map. Yeah, um, it's, it's down in this area. It's part of another structure, and it, it, they don't call it Eagle Ford on this particular map. 
unfortunately. Um, you talked about no cases of groundwater contamination. I thought that there was one in Wyoming because the fracking was done above permeable rock, impermeable rock rather. So it, it wasn't a very deep one. They did the fracking too low. It actually did some contamination of the. Groundwater. I'm not familiar with the with the case, but that would make some sense. And again, I, you know, I would have to cons consider that uh, an accident of, of the industry more than. And the fracking it, it process was, itself. It was, it was not an exception to the overall rule. It right. was an exception because it didn't follow the structure because, of the overall rule. Right, because they they misapplied the technology, basically. And, um, the, well, two quick ones. The, uh, well, <laughs> one, and, then, and then just a comment for you. Um, the lifetime, you said up to 90 years. There have been a, a wow. very few wells that have gone 90 years now. But, but what I've been reading is that the actual that the wells deplete a lot faster using this technology than they did before. So it requires a lot more drilling. Specifically, you know, this is a suggestion that investing on the services side, the people involved in the drilling and the fracking is more, perhaps more, uh, a better return on your money than investing in the actual oil companies that, <laughs> that are, are extracting. Um, that may very well be. But they typically, wells do have uh, a lifetime measured in decades. I mean, that's, that is the average. That's the industry average is decades. Uh, and that is a longer period of time than your, your um, traditional technology of just a vertical well bore into a sandstone salt bone. Um, you do get, get a little bit more. Those, those areas, like the, the old Barnett area where, where they were down to one to two barrels a day, right, right. yeah, you could still say those wells are producing, right? right? A few drops a day. That's not very much. No. Uh, and so the fracking is what has allowed that to come back. We do definitely get more that way. Just the, uh, your second slide. Yeah. I don't know if it's easy to go to that slide. I don't know if the, is that your graphic? It's not, it's not my graphic. Yeah. No. I oh. stole all of these. Yeah. It was just the the uh, the first graphic, the third slide I guess here. This one. Yeah. My, my point on that is just that it, it shows at the bottom something in blue. It looks like that's groundwater. Oh no, so it is not. That's a horrible graphic. Yeah, it point. is a horrible graphic. You're right. <laughs> Steve. Yeah, I, don't know. Yeah, I, I noticed that about the blue also. But one of those um, oil fields there um, is in the Texas Panhandle. And uh, that's also probably the best, biggest source by far in the world of helium. Um, is the fracking succeeding in extracting more helium out? Because there's, a, there's some concern we could actually really run out of helium. Yeah. I know of that concern. I don't know anything about the geology concern, uh, surrounding helium versus what, what's going on here. So I, I don't know how to answer that. I'm sorry. Okay. One last one. Um, I, I heard a number that sounded out of whack that maybe you can confirm. They said that CO2 product, or releases, um, I don't know, exhaust, whatever, in the U.S. has dropped by 20%. And a lot of that's been by switching power uh, plants over to natural gas because of the fracking, is that, I mean, that's, that's more than what they were doing with the Kyoto protocols and everything. I have a quick quote here from Bjorn, uh, Bjorn Lomberg, who is the author of The Skeptical Environmentalist. <clears throat> when he was asked about U.S. fracking, he, he said, I want to point out that green Europe promised to reduce CO2 emissions and only managed to cut by half of what you guys have done simply by fracking. Mm -hmm. right. And that's really the case. The, the use of natural gas produces, the burning of natural gas produces very, very low CO2 emissions. And because we're doing so much more natural gas today with our plants rather than coal fired and so forth, it's because it's so economically feasible to do that, we're actually seeing fewer CO2 emissions in the U.S. So if you buy into the argument that CO2 is a problem, this is part of the solution. But the environmentalists go, you know, no, 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 the, no, no, the, no, the more there's a solution, the more they will be opposed to it. Exactly. Like, yeah. 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 They'll, they'll yeah. just yeah. 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 Okay. What are some of the regulations that we're really? concerned about coming from our government? Oh, my God. It's, just every it's, it's a room full. <laughs> Everything. But does they want to shut it down? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. the intent. I mean, that's the intent, is to shut it down or to make it so economically unfeasible as to, as to shut it down. Yeah, I mean, that, that really is what so many of the government agencies are trying to do. And it's at the behest of the environment. So they're trying to destroy the oil industry in our country along the way. Trying to yes. destroy us. 
Yep. Yes. Well, I think the use of salt water would be welcomed because of global warming so. and the melting of the ice cap. Yeah. 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 Something with all they don't welcome anything. They always find something. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.